so. Uh, this is the final session for us today with the workshop. Um, thank you for sticking around. Hopefully the cookies and the coffee have kept you here a little longer. Um, one quick note is that in your folders was a feedback form for this workshop. We would really appreciate feedback. So if you wouldn't mind filling it out, there's a tray at the registration desk. And please, um, please, please do fill out whatever amount you can, but it will really help us um, understand how we did today and then what we can do next time. So uh, the plan that Richie and I devised for this report out is actually to have your roundtable hosts um, working with the University of Oregon law student that was um, taking notes at your table to give a quick summary of what they did at their, um, what they felt like were sort of the salient points and recommendations from their round table. And, uh, and actually I think that this is one of those times where we do want questions at the time after they've given their presentation. So uh, we're gonna start down with Mel and Carl. And I guess could you, if you could also just say who you are again for everybody's benefit giving their explanation and then as you have questions, we'll, we'll call you out. And Richie's in the back with the microphone as well. So let's just get started. You guys wanna go ahead? Sure, Mel Charles with the California Public Utilities Commission. And Carl Mundorf, Oregon Best. So we were tasked with identifying priorities with uh, supporting rationale and develop a list of the most promising or likely applications of energy storage in Oregon. And we came up with uh, operational integration, rural feeder, feeder capital deferral, peak smoothing and off-peak shifting from spring flows. And quickly we said uh, under operational integration that it would be longer term if we followed the mandate me method. And for proven technologies, uh, it would not need to have incentives, but for unproven technologies, you would probably still need incentives. Rural feeder, smaller capital cost to demonstrate, specifically if you used a battery system. Um, Led by private capital would be shorter term horizon, uh, time horizon, and by utility a longer term time horizon. Uh, moderate or considerable uh, cost and effort. On peak smoothing, if you did 100 megawatts of water heater storage, for example, then you're probably just looking at a code and standards change, and probably easy to implement, and probably a short time horizon. And then off peak in the spring, um, we thought that if you looked at underground aquifer, compressed air, then it'd be a considerable cost and effort, uh, but probably less here than elsewhere in the country in implementation and time horizon. That was the summary. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Carl and Mel about their round table? Or were there um, additional comments raised in other round tables on similar subjects? Hi, my name is Rhonda Walton, and I wanted to know if you were using an average, a national average, for your cost per point or your cost per kilowatt. I don't, don't believe we were. Okay. Yep. Well, any, can I ask? Yes, I think that's um, a good idea. <laughs> was, was there any, any in these applications that were specific, Pacific Northwest and would be uniquely different than say California or East Coast? I think we focused, I'm sorry. A lot of the discussion was what the priorities were for the specific, specific to the Pacific Northwest and Oregon, as opposed to, we didn't so much talk about the East Coast, but as opposed to California, so. Okay. Yeah. Did any of the other round tables touch upon this subject and come up with other um, priority applications. I know the demonstration projects discussion, for example, may have had that as a preliminary question as well. Did you come up with other um, priority applications? Yeah, do, are we shifting to our, or do you, are, we, are we going to this? <laughs> no, this is, now, this is the moment of Q&A for panel, uh, uh, round table one, but if yeah, it touches upon uh, your subject. So, um, well, in terms of applications, we talked about a number of applica potential applications for, for the state um, that would make sense. Of, uh, avoiding new peaking plants was one. Uh, avoiding T&D investment or deferring it uh, and substation investment was another. Uh, firming wind and avoiding curtailment and uh, achieving ramp rate control, control for wind was another. 
and resiliency benefits. Um, there was also the, a little discussion about a generation shortfall um, in a couple of winter months that's uh, apparently predicted to be uh, a problem within a few years. Uh, but, you know, in terms of, uh, do, we, do you want me a chance to, to go into what we actually came up with or just hand it back to no, them? No, just the applications okay. part, yeah. All Thank right. you. Sure. Do you have a question? Okay. okay well, great. You. Let's move on. I think this is, this is fine because we have six round tables. I'm yeah. not too worried about it. So next, do you want to get started, Michael and Vince, introducing yourselves and then uh, the subject matter that you addressed and what you found? Yeah. Yes. So I'm Michael Kintnamaya from PNNL. And we address the uh, energy storage values. Oh, Vince Sprinkle from PNNL also. Michael's going to give the kind of breakout here. Okay. Um, so we, we discussed it um, by framing the problem as uh, there is a, a customer side value. Um, there is uh, a value from the regulated utility perspective. And then there is uh, yet a different value uh, for renewable developers or storage uh, uh, developers as an independent uh, entity. Um, the, the overarching uh, problem that uh, spanned uh, across all of these different uh, stakeholders was a lack of transparency of what energy storage can really provide. And it's uh, something that uh, where we have problems looking at uh, the operational benefits, uh, whether that is uh, being a load and a generator uh, in one, uh, coupled with fast responding, uh, very accurately responding as uh, to AGC signals, automatic governor controlled sig uh, signals, as well as being uh, potentially a virtual inertia, which we are lacking more and more. Uh, with the, the large uh, turbine machinery um, uh, being uh, decommissioned. So the valuation of just simply operationally, what, what does it bring to the table that a gas turbine doesn't have? It's difficult uh, to, to quantify in an operational sense right now. And furthermore, it is very difficult to actually model, to project this out, what would the world look like in say uh, uh, 20 years, if more renewables uh, come online, if less inertia is available. So how do we then value these additional benefits uh, properly? Um, we uh, um, discussed uh, a couple of overarching method or, or philosophical questions, um, and that is which uh, then uh, place into the valuation, and that is, uh, can the market really resolve all of the problems uh, that we're seeing in the grid? In other words, uh, if, if it does not, we'll do uh, some kind of a mandate, such as an RPS, and it be done with it, even in the absence of valuing it. Uh, or should we create some markets as incomplete or imperfect as it may be, such as uh, imbalance hmm. market here that's talked about in the Northwest, um, and a definition of some clear products, um, such as a flexibility product that then uh, independent, uh, um, independent uh, developers uh, might design some, uh, some tools for it. So not having these product definitions there makes it also very difficult in the procurement uh, process uh, to offer up um, energy storage with these additional benefits. Um, I think there was an overarching um, awareness of urgency and that came then to the final wrap up of thoughts of recommendations. So we asked ourselves, so what would we tell if we had five minutes at the coffee table with the commissioner and uh, the head of the Department of Energy in Oregon um, to ask? And um, I think there was a sense of we cannot wait for California experience to go through and, and see what experience comes out of it and then uh, model something that we need to do something here now. Uh, there's urgency in the Pacific Northwest. There's a capacity deficiency. We need to address it plus flexibility deficiency. Um, there should be a compelling case study or a set of case studies that, looked at, uh, that looks at these additional values, be it coupled or be it individual, that energy storage can bring to bear 
plus a modeling component that um, scales it up to system-wide benefits because most case study were probably very limited in its scope, and then also a look at what uh, the impacts might be in terms of values uh, at scale. So if you have storage or flexibility uh, devices at larger scales. So that's our wish list. Thank you, I appreciate sort of the background and then leading you into the recommendations. Um, Todd and Dan, do you want to introduce yourselves and then um, give a similar overview? Thanks. Hello, my name's Dan Borneo with Sandia National Labs. Todd Olinsky-Paul with Clean Energy States Alliance. You want me to go ahead? Okay, so uh, we, we discussed uh, various potential applications. Our, our, the, the purpose was to sort of come up with an, uh, uh, an ideal or a, a potentially ideal type of uh, project or application for, this, for the state uh, for energy storage. And um, so we discussed uh, energy storage within microgrids as a, as a good, having good potential. Uh, we discussed various potential benefits of energy, energy storage in various applications. And I think what, what we eventually came up with was not a, a specific project, but we did come up with a, an example of a project that had a lot of the elements that we thought uh, might make something work. And um, Conrad, I have not forgotten about you. <laughs> the, the example um, which I thought was very interesting was a, was a University of Oregon Institute of Marine Biology campus which is coastal, um, therefore somewhat isolated from generation. Does, uh, doesn't have its own generator, although I understand there's a small wind turbine going in, but um, potential for more perhaps. But it serves a small community, uh, Charleston, which makes it potentially a place of refuge in case of, a, of an outage. Uh, has laboratories that are doing uh, valuable work that would be lost if there were uh, an outage of the grid. Uh, also, there are nearby fish processing plants, as I understand it, that could be potentially provide um, some fuel for, for digesters uh, or potentially be tied into a microgrid. Um, there's no diesel generators. That, apparently, they don't have backup. They have a, a applied for an NSF grant to purchase backup power. Um, they're also uh, developing a museum, which is interesting. Um, so. We thought that um, some next steps for, for a project like that would be to uh, look at what, you know, what is their load, what is their peak, um, is there potential for more on-site renewable generation, uh, what are, are there existing power, power quality issues at the lab, um, and, and is there a potential for, for resiliency benefit plus added value streams, but overall sort of overarching um, takeaway I think for a lot of a lot of this uh, this workshop is that uh, you know you, you're not probably not going to justify an energy storage project with a single benefit you need you need to stack benefits and value streams for a project and so uh, resiliency is, is is an excellent benefit it's very hard to put a price on um, until it is too late and then you have a price that it's too late to do anything about but uh, in addition to resiliency, you, you need other value streams. So, um, you know, are there opportunities for, for storage paired with renewables and, and some other kind of uh, perhaps small dispatchable uh, generation to, to provide additional values that streams that could be stacked? So, so that, that, was, that was sort of the, the example. I think um, another thing to sort of keep in mind is that this kind of a, a plan would work, would be justifiable perhaps where there's no natural gas availability. And again, uh, coastal location, as I understand it, there isn't. Um, where there is, you'd probably look at uh, CHP or something like that for, for, for a lot of these uh, benefits. And uh, so I, I should also add that Conrad has an excellent uh, proposal for remotely controlling uh, everyone's water heaters. And uh, we discussed that as well. It's not 
uh, I, I'm not sold, but I think it, it's a very interesting proposal, and I'd like to hear more about it. So. Sorry. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate that. Um, do you, Richie, do you feel like you want to go to questions in the audience, or do you want to just keep moving ahead? Pause and see if there's any questions on either, the, I guess, the value streams or demonstration projects. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, you, you, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned the um, you know the need to combine different value streams. Um, have, did you talk about you know, how do you allocate you know for, a, for if there's a resiliency issue, how do you allocate that segment of the cost to taxpayers versus um, you know the, the ancillary services benefits? How do you, rate, you know, allocate that element of this of the of that of the investment to to rate payers? Um, where, is, where is that conversation going to take place? And I, I don't think you have the answer, but we need, we need yeah. to get it someday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Henry Tillman, Tillman Associates. So that conversation would take place with the project development and uh, when you're doing your finances and hopefully, you know, with the project team, I, I think uh, those are very hard questions and it would be case specific of how, how you're going to justify those costs and where you're going to recover them recover them from. Sounds like good question. <laughs> we need to think harder about that. Any other questions from the audience right now? Hi, Pam Burkle, and I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about the water heater stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's, Conrad is right behind he's, he's you. sitting behind you. <laughs> and, and he'll, yeah. He will be here. I'll, I'll do it offline. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, uh, John Kreider from the Oregon PUC. Uh, I'm actually interested in any of the roundtable discussion panels to answer this, but uh, maybe the value guys specifically. Did you identify any um, rulemakings or any uh, possibly legislat legislation that uh, could set policy that would enable us to move forward <laughs> in, in energy storage? We actually talked about that a lot in our yeah. group. So maybe that's a good segue. Thor and Alan yeah. uh, so I'll, I'll just start, uh, Alan Heckenbottom, uh, Christensen Electric, I'll just set up uh, kind of what our structure was and I'll let Thor talk about. So we had actually had six questions, but the three because of the makeup of the panel, which was primarily regulatory concern, we had folks from Odo, the PUC, uh, CUB, um, Renewable Northwest, and then uh, a couple of folks from Development World and, and Thor. So we, we, we did focus on the policy side, um, building awareness um, through outreach and education for all the stakeholders. Um, which is what today was all about in many ways. Um, analysis and publications, but what that more translated to was in rulemaking, uh, determine how to determine value streams and how to get that done. And then the last part would be on the back end of that, um, once you've done that and you've done some pilot projects and you've done some work, how would you then go back and analyze what had been learned? So that's kind of what we spent our time on. Hi, I'm Thor Hinckley. I'm a contractor with BPA. And many of the, many of the, uh, Issues that we discussed at our table, I think, are touched upon and have been covered here, but uh, I'll just run down them uh, quickly. Uh, building awareness and education for, if, among stakeholders uh, for all of the multiple benefit streams from storage, and that can be at the customer level. I think uh, we know that uh, Puget Sound is looking, uh, excuse me, Puget Sound Energy is looking at a battery storage project on Bain Rouge Island. They're, they have an extensive outreach. Uh, public outreach program around that once they finalize the location. So we know that, you know, um, making people aware that this is um, a benefit and in, the, in particular the, the Northwest has a very energy literate population in many instances and so um, people are interested in, in this, uh, in, in a new emerging technology. Um, having the right rules leads to the right market, leads to standardization. That's just kind of a truism about we don't want to, we don't want to be um, too prescriptive in any of the legislation or, or the uh, uh, regulation we do around storage, we want to let the market emerge and the low price winner um, uh, be the leader. Um, we, we talked a, a lot about this issue of resiliency. I think that we realize that um, although it, 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 it's a cross-cutting idea, it, it spans um, both the energy and infrastructure and um, across a wide array of different institutions, but we, we, we think that they, the state uh, in particular may want to look at um, monetizing um, the, the benefits uh, for um, 
building resiliency for critical state infrastructure. We don't want our hospitals going offline when there's a, when there's a, a catastrophe or earthquake. We want prisons to be uh, to stay locked down. We want to keep uh, police and fire and emergency services going. And uh, and right now, I don't think that we, we we as a country have really spent a whole lot of time monetizing resiliency benefits. And well, so, well, I think that gets. And we talked a lot about where the PUC should be versus other things. And I think you end up in this place where the PUC creates rules that foster development of the industry through the grid stuff, but then on the hospital fire, does that not become more mandate? Like they have already have today, many mandates about data protection and other things. So rather than saying that's a ratepayer thing, that's a cost borne by the, whoever builds that thing because the rule is that you need to find something else that doesn't fail half the time if you have a power outage. Um, but the thing we, we talked a lot about, and I was hoping you'd answer this question, actually. Um, I've been through the rulemaking process many times. How do we get the PUC to take it up? I've done it on the legislative side. You know, we've said, passed legislation, net metering for feed-in tariffs says, go do that. I know there are other ways to do that. So we, we didn't get into what the value streams should be, but we talked a lot about how do we get the PUC to take that question up? Because that's like ground zero for the rest of this stuff. So that was probably the most of our time. Uh, well, beyond legislation, what is the end? Yeah, what? yeah. And what's the catalyst around that? How do we catalyze that to make sure that we get the cost-effectiveness studies completed? I think the answer. I think the answer. I think the answer is to work through uh, the planning process. I mean, we already have a lot of requirements for uh, for the utilities to do. Um, planning every two years and to provide. So you mean the IRP process? Through the IRP okay, so, process. All right, so that was a big discussion on our thing because yeah. we thought that wasn't good enough. And the reason we thought that wasn't good enough is until now, for the most part, it gets value to zero. So we have to first create a structure that says it has value and here's what the value is. And now you need to roll that into your IRP process. Well, but until I, we establish a value that it won't get value. I, I think you, you establish the value by going through the process. And, and what I mean is, we ask each of the utilities to do modeling into the future on the IRP process. I don't think that we have so far structured the modeling so that we can see what the en value of an energy storage system would be. I don't think we have that module in the different software that does the, the forecasting. But that's something the PUC can, can ma um, maybe not mandate, but we can sort of <laughs> we can pressure the utilities mm -hmm. to start to acquire that knowledge on how do you adjust your how do you make these additions to your forecasting models to have that slot in there to say this is okay what happens if you put 20 megawatts of energy storage into your long-term IRP uh, you know dispatch model do you see the present value revenue requirements change you know and then you can start to get a monetization of that value <clears throat> excuse me um, if you have if you're if you have that in the process and that's part of your resource your resource portfolio and I think that's what you're saying we don't have that currently as part of the resource portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, can I just add something to it? Um, so you, you could also see it from the other side and, and articulating a risk a scenario where you're saying um, here in, in Oregon um, we have uh, um, potential risk of tsunami and, and earthquakes. So what would be a plausible scenario, whether it's uh, within the next 100 years or uh, 200 years, but if that were to happen, you know, what is uh, a likely outcome? And then you basically work down, uh, you know, the outages that you have to deal with, you know, the, uh, uh, the restoration issues that you have, and if you uh, could accelerate this, you know, how much of a benefit would you reap? There's actually um, the, federal government uh, through the Quadrennial Energy Review, which the president uh, announced in December, will be looking at the intersection of uh, climate change related uh, risks uh, on the infrastructure across the entire um, energy system, uh, including transportation. And so there will be some analyses uh, done or some stakeholder outreach uh, to the regions looking at what are the specific risks and uh, what are the policy uh, levers to, to address those risks. I have a couple of quick points on that as well. Uh, one, approximately half of the damage from uh, d natural disasters is covered by private insurance, meaning that the other half is not. 
So your uh, local, state, and federal governments, meaning all of us, end up paying for half the cost of natural disasters. The other point that uh, I wanted to make was that there was a, a recent federal court case uh, in the state of New York, and the court found that New York City was in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act by not providing resilient power at public shelters. In other words, uh, when Hurricane Sandy hit and people went to shelters, those shelters were relying on the grid, which was down. And so that people who can't climb stairs and needed an elevator to access the shelter or had a rechargeable medical device or had uh, a, 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 an electric wheelchair that needed to be recharged or had uh, medication that had to be refrigerated, and they went through a whole list of people affected by this, were not actually receiving the benefit of the shelter and that this was discriminatory and that the city was responsible for providing real shelter to all its citizens, not just able-bodied citizens. If that's upheld, I, I don't know, I expect it'll probably be challenged, um, then that, that puts some real expectation on municipalities to up their game when it comes to uh, preparing for disasters in terms of providing resilient power. Thanks for that, Todd. I think some folks in the room, I, I don't know, is Roger here or Carmen or they may have left by now, but we did have some emergency service folks uh, that work for the state government and work for the local governments that have developed energy assurance plans. And so while the IRP may be limited, um, there are other, the commission also has jurisdiction over the function, the ESF for energy for the state. So there are other venues in which we can take this up that may not be traditional. So I wanna encourage you to continue to share these questions and concerns and know that there are other venues that may exist to you that you're just not aware of yet. Uh, Thor, did you finish your I did. list? I did. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to contribute about your? Table? No, I think we'll we'll wait for the question and answer session. Or okay. Further questions. Okay. Well, let's move on to. Uh, do you want Jason and Tom? You want to introduce yourselves and your table? Yeah, I'm Jason Ziskowski, and uh, this is Tom Melling, <laughs> <coughs> and our uh, roundtable topic was seamless integration into utility systems. And the main goal was to identify opportunities and suggested solutions to overcome technical challenges. Um, <clears throat> the first thing we came up with was standards for the battery energy storage systems, number one, and how the components of the systems communicate. And then uh, number two, the, to standardize the electrical interconnections between them, things like what's a allowable amount of ripple on the DC side uh, for the batteries and the PCSs to be able to work together. Um, the second thing was standardization for communications up to the utility and not just for the um, utility that may own and primarily operate the asset, but uh, Lee Hill from BPA brought up a good point on also having some sort of standardized communication between the utility and its balancing authority so that balancing authority also has the ability to leverage the asset and that also then becomes another value stream for the utility that owns the asset. So I uh, thought that was a real good point there and you know if someone like Bonneville Power Administration has to do this with multiple utilities and there's not a standardized way to do it, that becomes a big burden for them to you know figure out multiple different ways to do that. Um, another point was for utility engineers and folks in the utility industry to stay involved in the standards committees. Um, I think that was something that, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago and before, uh, utility engineers were very involved in their IEEE standards committees. Uh, but today, utilities don't put uh, as big an emphasis on that. Um, you know, we got less training. Uh, more capital projects to do, and so instead of focusing on those standard organizations, we're just trying to get our work done. Um, but if we just got vendors sitting in those standard organizations, they're going to give us what they want to give us, and we're not really going to have the opportunity to influence that. So I think that's a, a real good point there. And then also for the utility commissions, not just to push for the deployment of energy storage, say in megawatts, 
but also to push standardization in these energy storage systems. Um, I think they have the ability to do that. And then also uh, to push for, you know, how, how, what are the control systems that are going to be implemented to really leverage the assets? Because at the end of the day, you can put as many assets as you want out there, but if you don't have a, a optimization system to really um, optimize the use of those assets across your whole grid, you're not going to realize the total value, and I think that's really important, especially when you look at you know California putting out like 1.3 gigawatts. That's that's a lot of energy storage um, and a lot of money that's going to be invested by ratepayers. So you really want that to be utilized to the to maximize that. And then uh, the last thing was to just continue having discussions as we did today. I think everyone found this very useful. I know I've been to other conferences and get-togethers on energy storage, but I think this was a very interactive forum that um, really allowed us to get to the heart of a lot of issues and discuss a lot of important things. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for the nice pat on the back there <laughs> about the kind of workshop. I've really enjoyed it as well. Um, I, maybe we can have Roberta give her uh, talk, and then we can go to final questions. Does that work, Richie? Okay, great. Okay, so um, the roundtable that I hosted was financial mechanisms and tax policy recommendations, and I want to thank everybody who participated in that roundtable because I think we had a, a an excellent diversity of viewpoints and perspectives, and uh, I, I think we, I'm, I'm not going to say we solved all the problems, but, but I, I think we made, we made a good stab at it. So after talking about more specific things, uh, we, we ultimately came to the conclusion that we really need to think about, well, what is the overall goal for having energy storage to begin with? And as one of the roundtable participants said, the goal is to stop cooking the planet. So we thought we'd look at things from that perspective. Um, as a sub-goal, we talked about how energy storage and generation and distribution and transmission are all, uh, a lot of times they're siloed, and we think of those in isolation, but we really need to take a systemic view of the whole energy system and what can energy storage do in terms of the whole energy system. And some of the things would be deferring build out of transmission, um, but we may also, and avoiding building peaking plants, so avoiding new fossil generation. Um, we also noted that you might need different types of storage incentives depending on the attributes you're trying to encourage. But those incentives should be technology neutral. Uh, the maybe tax credits should be targeted to users rather than technology. So target tax incentives to distributed generation and, and small consumers and then maybe target different incentives to corporations or utilities. Incentives should be at multiple levels, federal, state, and local. And as an example of a federal incentive that we decided we liked, we, we endorse Senator Wyden's Energy Storage Act. That's a technology neutral incentive, 30% tax credit. Uh, state incentives can also be helpful, sales tax abatements, property tax abatements. Um, and at the local or maybe utility level, um, a more targeted one, and this goes to the resiliency point that several of the roundtables were focusing on, would be to create an incentive to replace diesel generation with energy storage instead. Uh, we noted that, and this goes to some of the valuation points that the other <coughs> roundtables were making, that energy storage really is subject to a, a number of different pricing failures, market failure, also a regulatory and accounting failure in that it's very difficult for utilities to tease out what is the value of energy storage um, when it comes to all the other things that go into an energy system. So maybe some of the ways to separate out the value and the accounting or incentivize um, the value of or determining the value of storage would be to have separate RFPs for storage, um, to maybe look at 
energy storage as maybe a cost of curtailed renewable energy or a cost of build out of additional transmission. And, and finally, and I'm so happy to have the last word here, um, of course our ultimate solution is a carbon tax. <laughs> there you go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I think we, we actually have all the way back across the panel. Any questions for all the folks up here? Lee? Lee Hall from BPA. This goes back to the value streams and, and also how to balance that at, so two, two comments. One is, I heard back here from, uh, is then, then who gets charged for the use of that for their purposes? So for example, be, be very brief, BPA has three basic rates, one for transmission, one for power to our preference customers, and the other for integrating renewables or integration rate on the transmission system, which essentially is what uh, independent power producers like wind farms pay to be on the system. So if we have an energy storage solution, we have to figure out from a BPA perspective at least who, gets, who uses it and when and then allocate those costs. That's pretty complicated. I'm not saying it can't be done, but that's one of the challenges. Along the same lines, when we say value streams, it's terrific. And, and in fact, we're thinking about the same things to ancillary services, uh, offset of transmission or offset of capital costs, you know, all the things that have been described. The, the question then becomes, how do you, uh, for example, if I'm, if I'm uh, asking a utility to create an energy storage project, when do they get to use it? And when does BPA get to use it? And how do you deconflict that, again, associated with the value stream? Do I get to use it half the time, and therefore I pay for half the cost? You know, how, how does that work? So there's, 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 uh, there's another layer of complexity, and I associate this with demand response and energy storage, which you've heard me talk about before, how to integrate those two, two, those multiple value streams. I think there's great prospect, but those are the devils in the details about how you allocate costs, how do you allocate its use, and, and, and I would suggest let's start out with the, the simple uses and the most defined uses first and build on that kind of on a building block approach, not swing for the fences right at first. But I, I agree with everything that's been said. Thanks, Lee. Did you have a qu question that you wanted someone to answer? Or? I mean, I, no, I, no, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I j j so just, j just recognize there's a level of complexity here that, that needs to be dived into when, we, yes. when, when multiple layers in the, in the user's matrix, uh, ISO or a BPA, uh, regional authority, any kind, and then taps into, um, I mean, even goes to the consumer level. What about a consumer who wants to use that battery at their house, maybe a f two or three or four kW battery, and they say, no, I don't, want, I don't want to sell that to the utility. I want to use it for my purposes. So, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, at every level of value stream, you have to start figuring out who gets to use it when, well, and then how do they tap into that value I, stream. I think Lee, that was, mm -hmm. like I said, 75% of our discussion was, was the establishment of what values are. And then every, to me, everything else rolls out. If you, if you have established a baseline, and I'm not sure how it would cross between, say, the Oregon PUC and the BPA world, and that is another question, but if you start out with an established set of what things are valued at, to me, the market figures the rest of that out. But, but until you know what things are worth, it, where do you start? Perhaps, but I just pose this, this last thought is, when, when, a, when a balancing authority needs uh, balancing reserves, they need them now. <laughs> you know, it's called a contract charge. issue. You're right in the contract. And, and you're right in the contract. And so there's, there are some complications or some complexity there. They're all workable, but we have to kind of face Bill, those. Bill, can, Bill Holmes, from K he can help us. <laughs> but one, thank, one, thank you. Thank you. One comment to that is you made a, a statement there about keeping it. What, what I heard was keep it simple. Right? Start at the start. start. And that's what we need to do because if we, if we just start trying to answer all the questions, from the get-go, we never, we'll never get there. We'll never, we'll never start, right? And uh, that's what Dr. Zhuk and this whole demonstration project is about: is doing the demonstration and and seeing it, touching it, feeling it, and and learning from it, and then moving moving on. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Lee, for those comments. Anyone else with a question? Are we all sort of energy storage out? <laughs> Our yeah, batteries are running low. Our yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. our There's reserves. so much sun material. Can so, yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Or Michael, I'll, and then I'll leave it up yeah. to my no, colleague from Sandia. No, you, okay. you go, because I, have, I just want to make a statement. I don't want to <laughs> <Okay. laughs> So we, we, we talked about uh, a compelling st case study, and uh, we, we kicked some ideas around what 
constitutes compelling case study or a set of compelling case studies to demonstrate value uh, is that uh, a plethora of uh, 50, you know, 50 megawatts, is it uh, 1.3 gigawatts uh, or prorated, you know, for the Oregon footprint? Um, what is it? And I'm, I'm wondering if the, uh, the folks that talked about demonstrations there addressed how much demonstrations do we need to do to get certainty on some of those valuations, that they are real and they can be captured? We don't have to do any of them. California's doing them every day. <laughs> <laughs> They're so far ahead. So, so even though we, we still talk in terms of demonstrations, I, I think we're actually moving towards we're just doing projects. Right, and, and we're just continuing to learn because you, you, you look out there and there's uh, 300 projects. Well, in the big scheme of things, that's really not a lot to, if you're, if you're gonna put a lot of, um, like UPS systems, for instance, if, if you're in a semiconductor manufacturing, if somebody said, I have 300 installations, they would say, come back when you have about 10,000 and we'll install your system, you know, uh, just because of the, the risk. Involved. So the more projects we do, that it's just it's just about getting getting numbers under our belt, getting experience. But I mean, I guess my point was that there are there are so there are going to be so many projects going in the next couple of years that we will have um, there'll be a lot of data for us to access. Well, let me let me be then if, the if they'll advocate. give it to us. Well, I, and I think a lot of people brought up in, in ours that the need for transparency, so the transparency of that complex system. So where, do, as I'm trying to determine the values, multiple value streams, can I capture all that, you know? And so that, that becomes a key, key issue there is, can that get out there so everyone can figure out, you know, where it is? Okay. So let me just ask the question, if, if California does it, um, you know, is, is there a, a need in Oregon to do its own demonstration project or could we basically just uh, sit at the sideline, wait for that um, experience to play out, and then learn from it? Well, we'll have to do a little bit of our own, but I'm speaking, I spent most of my time up until now in the solar industry, and we, 90% of what we needed to know to go to business was determined in California in the previous five years. And yes, we needed to tune it to some Northwest things, but California through the CEC, and the mandates they had around solar. They really built all the standards that we use in the solar industry today. Um, and, and yes, we had to make some adjustments, but they, they built so much of what we rely on. Yes, Praveen? Thanks, I, following up on Dan's point about going from doing demonstrations to doing projects, um, I sort of have two questions. One is, um, the, uh, the issue about the IRP, it, does anyone have a good understanding of why storage is not comprehensively modeled in IRPs in Oregon right now? Crickets. Uh, follow up, if, um, if there's some difficulty in getting that to happen, um, is there, would the state fund one of these brilliant uh, national labs to, or e even a, a couple of states could get together and do this and say, run a model with you know, these regional balancing authorities represented, peel through everyone's latest IRP and say of all the uh, capacity resources, or you know, peel through the, um, the council's plan say you're gonna do you know, 25%, 50%, and 100% instead, uh, instead of gas turbines doing energy storage instead, and just say, okay, here, here's the benefits analysis. Could, could we do that? Who, who's gonna sign up to fund that? What, Praveen, I think with all the successful projects you got going on, we could just get your data and, and just kind of figure <laughs> it out from there. <laughs> Well, no, I'm, I'm talking about like a, a, you know, system modeling benefit study. I mean, I, you know, Michael's done a bunch of these. Um, your colleagues, uh, Jim Ellison's done a bunch at Sandia. NREL does them all the time. Um, it, is there enough interest now in the region that someone could just 
you know, whatever the, you know, whatever millions someone was going to pay for one of these demonstration projects, and there have been millions and millions poured into that of, uh, of customer and taxpayer money, it, you know, you put a couple hundred thousand towards one of these studies, and and then have kind of a, a bulletproof rationale for saying yes, this has to now be in planning and procurements. Or, or find out it's not valuable and stop talking well, about it. Yeah, Praveen, right? that was, again, that was a huge part of our discussion. And I think the reason that you heard silence when you asked your first question is I think we all have opinions, but it's a mixed crowd. So the second one is back to the PUC question. Maybe it's not a rulemaking, but it was, you don't want the utilities funding that study probably any more than you want a storage company funding that study. So how do we find the right um, third party or mix of third parties to do that? So maybe rather than a rule, maybe that's the right question, but something that allows us to roll vetted, uh, uh, you know, as clean a data as we can into that process. But you're right. How do that was that was most of what we talked about. How do you get to that? How do you fund that? Yeah. And the PUC seemed like the right place, but how do we get them to go do it? Tom, did you have a comment? I guess I had a question that was a follow-up to Praveen's first question, which is um, we have seen in the state of Washington uh, reluctance by IOUs to go forward with energy storage because they're unsure if it's going to be rate-based. And to what extent can the PUC give some guidance as to when it will be rate-based? Because that's, that's a big unknown, and they have to move forward and do the storage project and then apply and see if they can get a rate base. It seems like it's a bit of a backwards process. Can, can I? Um, <laughs> we we had exactly this discussion there with the uh, California uh, Public Utilities Commission. It's just too bad that Mel has left already. Um, and uh, um, this very question was uh, put in front of the uh, IOUs in California, and uh, they did not agree of having a uniform framework for the IRP process for distribution systems. Uh, investments to move forward. Each utility company had their own tool sets and uh, felt comfortable that they can be modified and enhanced to address energy storage. They did recognize that the tools are incomplete and uh, work needs to be done. But there was not um, the appetite for coming together, nor was there of guidance from the CPUC uh, to suggest that they ought to. You know, I really, um, I really value this conversation. Actually, sometimes the interplay between panelists um, is where we get the most meat. And I just want to maybe wrap it up, but also explain that we're lis we listen today, and we have notes. We have detailed notes, I think, from our law students on a lot of the concepts, and of course, we're listening today to the panelists, and we're gonna take those back, and Richie and I are gonna find a way to make sure that that information comes out as outcomes from this workshop. So I'm really grateful to hear all of the ideas that you've, you've put together in your roundtables. Um, could everyone join me in thanking the roundtable hosts? <laughs>